with you and my soul sings out as your word throws down far away I sing to you and my heart cries holy hallelujah father you're near my hope is in you lord all the day long i won't be shaken by drought or storm a peace that passes understanding is my song and i sing my Selfishness, you show me grace. I worship you, and my heart cries glory. Hallelujah, Father, you're here. My hope is in you, Lord, all the day long. I won't be shaken. Trusted love 
is with me till the end. How great this love! Oh, it's closer than a brother. This is love. He died so I could live. But he is good, and he is God. And what I earn is not what I got. And he is just, yet oh so kind. What I deserve. say about him, my God is love. Well, good morning, Gathering Church family. So good to have you part of our online gathering here today or whenever it is that you're watching. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jeff and I'm the lead pastor at the gathering. And it's just such a joy to have you along for the ride here today as we worship Jesus together online. Now, I know what you're thinking. If you're a regular around here, you know that you don't typically see me on the front end of the service. You see me a little bit later on. Typically, Kristen is the one welcoming you and bringing some announcements on behalf of the church. Well, unfortunately, Kristen uh, came down with a case of COVID over the past week. She's had COVID in her home, actually, for the last couple weeks, and uh, she had hoped to still be able to record and do these announcements, but she said to me just, uh, just yesterday, I'm recording on Friday morning, she said, I just don't think I have enough energy to be able to pull it off this week. And if you know Kristen, you know that she requires a lot of energy. She uses a lot of energy in her announcements and basically in everything that she does. And so for her to not be able to do that, it's a pretty big deal. It tells you a little bit of how she's feeling. So I would invite you to be you know, praying for Kristen and, and for her, her two foster boys as they uh, you know, recover from, from COVID uh, this week. Uh, but what that means for today is that you're stuck with me as it relates to announcements. And so I'll do my best to try to match Kristen's energy. I don't think I could ever actually match her energy, but I'll do my best to keep you engaged here as we uh, enter into a place of worship together online as a church family. At The Gathering, we exist to connect to the love of Jesus. And so whether you're already a follower of Jesus or not yet sure what you believe about Jesus, our hope, our prayer is that you would experience his love in some way here this morning and that maybe you just take one step closer to him in your spiritual journey. And we're here for you to help you experience the love of Jesus. If you're looking to connect with our church, if you've got questions about spirituality or, or faith, if you want to talk to a pastor, if you want to get connected into a small group, whatever, if we can serve you, help you in any way, if you've got a need, 
please reach out to us by using our online connect card. You can find those on our website, thegatheringottawa.com slash connect. Fill out that connect card. Let us know how we can help you, how we can serve you, and we will reach out to you and get in touch with you in the days ahead. As you might know, we are also gathering this morning, not just online, but in person again at St. FX High School. And uh, not sure how many people will be able to join us this morning. I know, you know, there's still lots of concerns about Omicron and, and what's going on in the world and stuff like that. But hopefully a few of us are, are actually together as you're watching this in person, worshiping Jesus as well, part of the same church family as uh, you are. And I uh, want to invite you, if you feel at all comfortable in the weeks ahead, we're kind of going week by week by now, but the assumption is that we're going to be together in person and online every single week. So if you're comfortable, we'd love to have you join us in person at St. FX High School in Riverside South at 1030 a.m. as we worship Jesus in person together. And uh, as you know, we need connection. We were built and made for connection, created to be with one another and to worship together. And so I'd invite you, as long as you're comfortable, uh, maybe next Sunday to join us in person, 1030 a.m. at St. FX High School. I uh, also want to invite you, if you are newer to the church and uh, are considering maybe getting more involved, more connected uh, in the church, or maybe you've got questions about how things run, uh, why we do what we do, what we believe, what we believe, if you want to learn more about our denomination, if you just want to get connected, I want to invite you to a virtual workshop called Gathering 101, which is happening on Wednesday, February 9th from 7.30 p.m. till 9 p.m., where we're going to take a little bit of a look under the hood, tell you a bit of our story, unpack you know, a bit about what we believe, and just invite you to ask your questions about our church and all that kind of stuff. So if you're at all interested in that, if you want to get connected in that way, want to learn more about us, would invite you to do that. You can email me uh, at jeff at thegatheringottawa.com to register just so that we know if you're planning to attend, that would be helpful. Uh, if you're looking to get connected in membership as well, this is something that everybody's kind of required to do prior to membership, just to make sure that everybody's on the same page in terms of our vision and values and how we're wired and all that kind of stuff. So please, if you're looking to become a member, looking to get connected or learn more about our church, Gathering 101, Wednesday, February 9th from 7.30 till 9 p.m. on Zoom. And then on Wednesday, March the 9th, a full month later from 7.30 till 9 p.m. as well, we have our annual general meeting. And this meeting is uh, particularly for our members. Everybody's welcome to attend, whether you are a member or not, but only our members are able to vote. We've got a few things to vote on this year. We're incorporating as a church which means we have new bylaws that we have to pass and all this kind of stuff. We've got a budget to look at as always, and we're hopefully gonna have a couple new uh, members of our elder board that we wanna have our membership affirm in addition to other reports and, and uh, updates and things like that from the staff and board of elders and all that. So March the 9th, uh, 7.30 p.m. on Zoom. It's gonna be virtual as well. I wanna invite you to mark that, put that date in your calendar, especially if you're a member, plan to attend, we need you there for sure. So look forward to seeing you then. This morning, we're going to worship by opening the Bible in just a little bit. Dan's here this morning. He's going to be sharing the word this morning, which is an act of worship as we learn about what it means to follow Jesus and look at uh, the word, look at the Bible and see what it is that God is saying to us through it. We're going to hear some music as well, a kid's corner, uh, but also want to invite you to give with your finances as well to worship Jesus by being generous and by giving just a portion of what God has entrusted to you back to his kingdom, back to his work in and through the local church. So if you're looking to give this morning to tithe uh, on your uh, income this morning, we would uh, invite you to, to do that by going to thegatheringottawa.com slash giving. There's instructions there for you and how you can do that uh, virtually as well. E-transfer, Canada Helps, whatever works for you. Just wanna invite you to prayerfully consider what God's inviting you to do with your finances here this week. Well, this morning, as I mentioned, we're in for a treat. Dan's bringing the word. If you want to track along with his message here this morning, you can find notes for this morning's sermon on uversion.com or using your Uversion Bible app underneath the events section. You should be able to find us there if you search us up. And uh, just excited for what it is that God has to say to us this morning through Dan. I'll be back in a little bit, going to read some scripture um, before he comes. But as we get started this morning in worship, let me pray and invite the Spirit of God uh, to work in our hearts this morning so that we can love him more fully and follow him more closely. Let me pray. Jesus, we thank you for our church. We thank you that we're able to gather like this together online 
and in person as well. And uh, we do pray that you be honored and glorified in our worship this morning, that you give us hearts that are open to what you want to say to us, and that we'd be able to uh, just connect with you in some way here this morning, wherever we're at in our spiritual journeys with you, that we'd be able to experience your love, connect with you in some way, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you in just a couple minutes. A baby in a basket. Way back in Bible times, God's children, the Israelites, ended up being slaves in Egypt. They were beaten and made to work very hard. They cried out to God to rescue them, and God heard them. You see, at this point, the Pharaoh was getting a bit worried. God's children were beginning to grow in numbers, and if Pharaoh didn't do something about it, they might soon outnumber the Egyptians. There would then be more slaves than Egyptians. So Pharaoh made a law saying that all the baby boys of the Hebrew people must be killed. Can you imagine that? Awful! Well, there was a Hebrew woman named Jochebed, and she had a baby boy named Moses. She didn't want him to be killed, so she made a plan. She made a basket out of bulrushes, and she put baby Moses into it. Then she set him afloat on the Nile River to save his life. She had Moses' older sister Miriam hide in the bulrushes and watch her little brother to make sure that he was okay in the basket. Everything was going according to her plan until something unexpected happened. Pharaoh's daughter came to the river to bathe because in those days they didn't have bathrooms like we do now. When she got to the edge of the river, she saw the basket floating in the water. She saw that there was a baby inside and she knew that one of the Hebrew women must be trying to hide her son so that he wouldn't be killed. She picked up the baby and held him. She must have fallen in love with him because she decided to keep him and raise him as her son. And the story doesn't end there. Miriam, who was watching from the bulrushes, jumped up and asked Pharaoh's daughter if she needed a nurse for the baby. In those days, a nurse was like a nanny or a babysitter. Pharaoh's daughter thought that was a great idea, so Miriam ran off to get her mom to be the baby's nurse. Can you believe it? Moses' mom got to be her son's nurse, and she even got paid to look after him. You can't get much more amazing than that. Now, you might be wondering what this has to do with God rescuing his children from slavery. Well, here's a quick finish to our story. When Moses grew up, he was called by God to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. He helped to rescue them and lead them out of the land of Egypt with God's help. Maybe you know that story, but we'll have to save the rest of it for another time. So you see, God had a plan all along. You know what's next, right? You guessed it. This is what I want you to remember about baby Moses. Moses was born into a regular family, just like Jesus was, and just like you were. You're not a prince or princess, are you? God had a plan for Moses' life, just like he had a plan for Jesus' life on earth, and just like he has a plan for your life. And lastly, Moses helped to rescue the Hebrew people from Egypt just like Jesus was the ultimate rescuer of the world when he died on the cross for us. His was the final rescue. And you know what? You can be a rescue helper too, just like Moses. When you tell others about Jesus dying on the cross to save us from sin and death, you are sharing the good news with them so that they can be rescued or saved. Here is a verse you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Matthew 5, 14a and 16b.
I've carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation. condition had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart and I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand can't comprehend all I know is This morning's scripture reading is taken from John 3, verses 1 through to 21. This is the passage that Dan's going to be preaching on here this morning. Can't wait to see how God speaks to us through it. Let me read this passage of scripture for you. John 3, verses 1 through to 21. There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religious leader who was a Pharisee. 
After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the spirit. How are these things possible? Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are respected. You are a respected Jewish teacher, and yet you don't understand these things. I, sh I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen, but yet you won't believe our testimony. But if you won't, or sorry, uh, but if you don't believe me, then I tell you about earthly. When I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. And as Moses lifted up the bronze snake on a pole in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. But anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only Son. And the judgment is based on this fact. God's light came into the world, but people loved the darkness more than the light, for their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. But those who do what is right come to the light so others can see that they are doing what God wants. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray before Dan brings uh, the message here today. Well, Jesus, we do thank you for your word and this incredible story with Nicodemus and the incredible truth within it, that in Christ, because of you, because you came, because you were lifted up on a pole, on a cross, we can, have, we can experience, we can have eternal life in you. I pray for everybody watching that we would know that life in you, eternal life, starting here and now and going on forever. And God, we pray for every person in our church who is sick right now. Um, there's lots of people with COVID. We think particularly of Kristen and the boys as they recover from COVID and do pray that you'd provide your healing power. We think of other families too. Many of us know different uh, families, different people in our church and in our lives who are sick. And so we lift them up in prayer as, as well and ask that you would provide healing for each person watching. There's other concerns too, other needs, people who are battling cancer in our church these days and people who are battling mental illness, and people who are battling all sorts of challenges of different kinds. God, would you be, be our provider, our healer, uh, the one that we look to for strength when life is really hard? Would you uh, remind us that you are with us in and through everything as we follow you as your kids? Uh, this morning, we want to open our hearts to you this morning, ask uh, you by your spirit to speak to us through Dan, through your word, and help us to take one step closer to you in our faith journey, we pray. It's in Jesus' name. We pray all these things. Amen. Well, God bless you guys. I'm going to be back preaching next week. We're starting our new, uh, not new series, we're starting back into our series on the book of Acts, uh, which we started back in the fall. So can't wait to do that and uh, invite you to be together with us online or in person next week. But for now, so thankful for Dan, his ministry uh, with us and with Bytown Community Church downtown. So let's uh, be ready to hear from God this morning through Dan as he brings the message. See you next week. Hello, um, it is really good to be with you and um, I hope you are all doing well. And um, I know many of you probably know me and some of you may not. Uh, my name is Dan Chuck Reed and I'm a church planner here in downtown Ottawa and uh, pastor of a little church called Bytown Community Church. And we are a church plant of the gathering. And um, I'm really grateful for uh, that partnership that we have and the opportunity that we have to work together. And it's really good um, to be here with you um, today. Um, you know, for many of us, 
2021 felt like a dark year. And the year began with a raging pandemic and a series of lockdowns here in Ottawa uh, during January and at Easter. And um, I think it's fair to say that online schooling was unpleasant for many of us. And our world uh, can feel like it's getting pretty dark. We're seeing a greater impact from climate change with raging forest fires and dramatic flooding in BC. And our news feed can be dominated by um, pretty uh, hard stories. And uh, it may just be me, but I feel like there's more and more stories of natural disasters taking place all over the world. And on a personal level, I know many who are struggling with sickness and hardship. There are many who are getting, just getting over COVID or struggling with illness even right now. And in addition to the stress of the pandemic, our health challenges continue to create anxiety and stress for many. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I was reading a New York Times opinion article and the author, Margaret Renkel, she writes, feeling the darkness descend, we beg for more light. And in the presence of so much darkness, where do we find light? You know, where do we find hope? It's important for us to wrestle with this question and we need to find the truth and cling to it. Are the answers found in science? Is research and discovery key to solving the world's issues? Is light found through mindfulness and helping one another find, you know, our authentic self and trying to live true to that? Do we just simply need an increased human effort to love? You know, if more people just simply stand up for the vulnerable and fight injustice, will that solve the deep issues that we face? You know, this spring, I expect we're going to hear a narrative that we just need better government leaders and policy as we go into a provincial election. In her article, Ms. Rankle suggests that the darkness comes from the following, and uh, be patient with me as I try to read this quote. The metaphorical gloom of the dark ages, permeated by ignorance, animated by inchoate fears and tribal loyalties, and enforced by violence. This darkness, she writes, attempts to extinguish the light of science, of art, of freedom and it wants to smother truth itself. And you know, as I, I was reading her article, I wondered, is the solution that simple? You know, is the darkness we face just because of ignorance, violence, and tribalism? And can we truly change the world if we just figure these things out? And as I was thinking about it, I would say that a bunch of my neighbors in downtown Ottawa would be tempted to say yes and agree with this position. As followers of Jesus, how do we respond when the world feels so incredibly dark? Does our faith make a difference and how should we position ourselves, especially in a time that feels so polarizing? Well, today we're gonna look at the story of Nicodemus. And this story contains mysterious metaphors, memorized verses, and an interaction between two humans that I believe still speaks profoundly to us today. So I want to invite you to journey with me as we uncover ancient truths about the depths of God's love for us and what it means to live in the light, truth, and how to flourish. You know, this story begins by giving us some really in insightful and helpful information about the character Nicodemus. We learn that he's a Pharisee. He's among the religious elite of the Jewish people and his whole life revolves around studying the law and vehemently seeking righteousness. Not only is he a Pharisee, but he's also called a ruler or a leader among his people. He'd be well respected. He'd carry authority. And it's likely that he's highly educated and intellectual. Lastly, I just want to invite you to take note that the name Nicodemus in Greek actually means victory among the people. And we know that names and their meanings carried a lot of weight in this culture. And so I wonder if his name potentially points to this hope that God would send, you know, the promised Messiah, the rescuer who would help set the Jewish people free. Also, I want to invite you to take notice of the setting in this story. 
the interaction happens at night and scholars are not exactly sure what the meaning is. However, light and darkness are extremely important in the Gospel of John. And personally, I think this detail should not be overlooked. Is Nicodemus trying to hide the fact that he's talking to Jesus? Is he afraid of the repercussions of a religious leader being seen consulting Jesus? Is Nicodemus ashamed of his own curiosity about Jesus' teaching? Or perhaps he's investigating Jesus, you know, on the fence of whether or not he thinks Jesus is a friend or a foe and searching for more clues to make his own verdict. Regardless of the motivation, as the story unfolds, may you not forget that John wants us as the audience to know that Nicodemus is in the dark, spiritually, intellectually, and in his own ability to see truth. Don't overlook the importance of setting. So Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he's addressed as, a, he addresses Jesus as a rabbi, as a teacher. And he notes the authority that Jesus carries when he speaks and he acknowledges that authority. And in addition, he says that based on the signs that he's seen, he knows that Jesus must be sent from God. John gives us no insight as to what these miracles may have been except the turning of water into wine. The hearer and the reader of the Gospel of John are left to wonder what these signs are that Nicodemus is referring to. In response to Nicodemus, Jesus says, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. And this mysterious statement can also be translated born again. It throws our dear friend Nicodemus for a loop. Is Jesus talking about physical rebirth? He may not be able to comprehend how a person could be born a second time. And, you know, if we're honest, lots of my neighbors and even me agree. We don't understand it either. It makes no sense on a physical level. And moreover, on a spiritual level, I invite you to see that Nicodemus likely has no category for needing new life. He is a son of Abraham. His whole life has been devoted to the God of Israel and to his law and their Jewish religion. And Nicodemus would pride himself on his holiness. If anyone was going to get into heaven, it should be him. Why would he, of all people, need spiritual rebirth? He's good. He's in with God. You know, those in need of repentance are the unholy people, you know, the ones who are responsible for why the world is such a mess. The people who are known for public failure or disgraceful vocations or those outside of the Jewish faith. Furthermore, as a seasoned religious leader, he likely doubts that anyone can truly have a new and fresh start. How could a grown adult let go of their entire past, their identity and their history, and begin a new journey? He can, um, how can all of one's shortcomings, mistakes, and faults be forgotten and put aside? The idea seems ludicrous, especially for those who feel like they are lugging this dark shadow around with them. Regret, habitual sin, pain, perhaps even past abuse. For some, no matter what they do, how far they run, they simply cannot forget their past or simply start over. It feels not humanly possible. So Jesus, in response to Nicodemus's skepticism, he states that to enter the kingdom of God, one must be born of water and spirit. And this part of the conversation gets even more confusing, even for scholars. Is Jesus simply talking about how everyone essentially needs two births, you know, like a physical one and a spiritual one? And if that is what Jesus meant, then why say born of water? Like the text here seems odd. And it does mention that um, what is born of the flesh is flesh in the next verse. You know, some scholars wonder if Jesus is referring to the sacramental practice of baptism. The story after this one is actually about baptism. And, you know, is Jesus saying that in order to be part of the kingdom of God, we need rebirth, both through the practice of publicly proclaiming our allegiance to Christ through baptism and through receiving the Holy Spirit? You know, there are scholars who accept this reading. 
I want to draw our attention to a clue from the Old Testament that may help us understand this verse. Um, Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27. I'm going to read it for you. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. I love this. A new heart I will give you and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and I'll give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. We see here in Ezekiel that God has promised centuries before that a time will come that God will cleanse us from our sins. He'll fill us with his spirit and he'll transform our broken hearts. We can't know for sure if Jesus is alluding to this text, but it's fair to say that Jesus is in the business of both purification and transformation. He loves to take the things that are old, dead, and broken and bring newness, life, vulnerability, and human flourishing. So Jesus could be saying that in order to enter into the kingdom of God, you need to be purified from both your impure impurities and imperfections and allow God's spirit to live within you. You know, whichever interpretation you take, it, the emphasis is clear. Jesus is encouraging Nicodemus that children of God need to be born of the spirit. And it's interesting here because the Greek, um, the word for spirit and wind are actually the same. And so we see that Jesus starts to compare the spirit of God to the wind. And I personally think Jesus is inviting us into mystery. You know, we cannot see the wind. We cannot control the wind. And it's the same with the spirit. However, you can see the effects of the wind and you can hear the sound. And in the same way, we should be able to see the impact of the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of those who are children of God. Nicodemus, as he's hearing Jesus talk about these things, continues to struggle to comprehend what Jesus is saying. There could be a resistance to what Jesus is saying, or perhaps Nicodemus is just trying to figure out how does this fit my previous ideas or categories of how the kingdom of God works. And Jesus begins to get a little less patience in his response. He asked Nicodemus, how can you be a teacher of Israel and not understand these things? It may sound a little bit like bullying or condescending, but I wonder if Jesus is actually just lovingly trying to ask the Pharisee for some humble self-reflection. Nicodemus may actually need his ego to be dampered a little bit. You know, perhaps he's lost some of his curiosity and flexibility to learn new things. Maybe Jesus is inviting him into deeper revelation to realize that he doesn't understand as much as he thought he did. You know, I wonder that even though he's a religious leader who teaches about God for a living, you know, perhaps he needs some more humility. I often have that experience. So Jesus challenges him that if he doesn't understand earthly things, how could he teach about spiritual things? And I would just like to note that uh, I commented how scholars can't even agree about what it is meant, what it means to be born of both water and spirit. So it looks like Nicodemus is not alone in his inability to understand these earthly things. You know, when I read over the text, uh, you can see it here. I put so many question marks next to things and have so many notes um, that I end up feeling in a very similar place to our dear friend Nicodemus. I think that John has constructed the argument to invite the reader and the hearer actually into a bit of a place of mystery. Jesus continues his teaching, commenting that no one has ascended into heaven except the son of man who's descended. He speaks of this authority and gives a window into his identity. He wants us to see that the signs he's performing are not just pointing to being blessed by God, but they're signs that are pointing to his true identity, the Son of Man. And um, the Son of Man 
is such an interesting phrase. It's like a little parable or riddle in and of itself. Most commonly, people understand son of man as a term in light of Daniel 7, 13. And in this passage, the term son of man is pointing to the promised Messiah, who will one day bring judgment to the earth and restore God's people. The son of man is the rescuer that Israel is waiting for, who will one day restore them and empower them as a nation. But it's good for you to know that in Ezekiel 2.1, son of man is simply used to speak of Ezekiel as a prophet. And in Psalm 8, verse 4, son of man is used to just refer to a fragile mortal human. You know, so even though Jesus speaks about himself as the son of man, the promised one that the Jewish people have been waiting for, it still comes in parables. When referring to himself as the son of man, there's mystery. He invites the listener, he invites Nicodemus to lean in, to press in with questions and need to humbly seek out the answers. You know, Nicodemus could interpret son of man to mean lots of different things. He goes on to say that the son of man will be lifted up. And he refers to an ancient story from Numbers 21, where Moses makes a serpent from bronze and lifts it up. The people in the wilderness had grown impatient and complained against God. If you remember, the Israelites had been in slavery in Egypt uh, under Pharaoh, and God had sent Moses to set the people free. But they didn't get to the promised land right away. They spent 40 years in the desert uh, needing to trust that God would actually be faithful to his word. And they were hungry and they were thirsty. And even though God provided manna in the desert, they became very, very um, done with manna. They wanted something else. And personally, when I look at my life, I bet I would be in that same situation. You know, if you look up privileged in the dictionary, you'd probably see my beautiful face smiling back at you. And so what happens because of their complaints? Well, unfortunately, disaster. God sends venomous snakes to the Israelite camp and many people get bit and die. And, you know, you could make a pandemic joke here, but it's, a, it, I think, a very tragic situation. The people cry out to God and they go to Moses aware of their sin and they ask that Moses would intervene and pray to take the snakes away. And in Numbers 21, 8 to 9, God instructs Moses to make a snake and put it up on a pole. And he says that those who are a bit can look at the snake and they'll live. And in obedience to God, Moses makes this bronze snake and he puts it up on a pole and all those that look upon the serpent live. And it's amazing, you know, that people don't have to do anything except look. And what faith it must have taken to just go and look at the pole after you've been bitten and trust that God would intervene on your behalf. And Jesus references this obscure little story. And he prophesies that there'll be similarities between him and this bronze serpent. And that in the same way that the snake needed to be lifted up, so will the Son of Man. What a powerful story. Here at the beginning of the Gospel of John, we have foreshadowing of how Jesus will die. He'll be lifted up because of the sins of the world and all those who look upon him with faith will not only live, but they'll live forever. And now we get that famous verse that so many of us know so well. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. And interestingly enough, it's unclear here whether Jesus is speaking or if John, as the narrator, is giving commentary to us, the reader. You know, some scholars and even red letter Bibles are divided. And when I think about it, if I'm honest, And I don't know about you in your context, but definitely in my context, downtown Ottawa, I feel like I've quietly been avoiding this verse. John 3.16 has been quoted so often that it almost can feel like it loses its power. 
And it's become associated a bit with random signs at a football game or altar calls or street evangelists. And I wouldn't be surprised if some of you actually don't feel like you like this verse that much anymore, or you're afraid to use it in a conversation with a neighbor. However, in the context of this conversation with Nicodemus, as I've been looking at this text, this verse has come alive to me once again, and I'm realizing how profound it is. For God so loved the world. These words would have burst Nicodemus's worldview like right open. You know, in the mind of a Pharisee, God is not sending the Messiah to rescue and save the whole world. God is going to rescue Israel. God's gracious love is further reaching than Nicodemus could ever imagine, despite his knowledge of the scriptures. And not only that, there's a relationship between a belief and eternal life. And this idea would have been very difficult for this Jewish reader. In his mind, it was through ancestral lineage that you were invited to be a child of God. And yet God is creating a whole new family not based on ethnicity or family line, but based on belief. Jesus is rattling Nicodemus's understanding of the world that profoundly impacted how he interacted with others. Notice God's desire for people not to perish. And this little note in the text may seem um, insignificant to us, but is profound. Our default is not to love our enemies. You know, we struggle to extend grace and mercy to those who have hurt us or wronged us. Our desire is for justice. You know, we want someone to pay for the crimes that they've committed. But this is the mindset of God. Though we have turned away from him, though we have done things our own way, though we have rejected him, though we've hurt his children and his creation, his world that he loves so much. He loves us. He desires for all people to know him and he wants humanity to flourish. He wants all of his children to experience eternal life and he creates a pathway for them to be reconciled with him and the entire cosmos through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And interestingly enough, this eternal life is not just a future reality that we look to, but the Greek here is in the present tense. Jesus is offering us life now and forevermore. He wants us to experience freedom from death, guilt, shame, bondage, sin, and our broken humanity now as well as in the future. And this promise is beautiful. And then John continues, you know, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn it, but so that we might be saved. You know, God is not this angry father looking to catch you committing wrong, preparing to make you suffer for what you've done. No, he sees us in our struggle. He sees the ways that we've been entangled in lies, confusion, addiction, violence. He sees the unbearable ways that shame drives us to hide, protect, project a false self. He sees our anxiety. He sees the ways we've hurt each other. You know, the pain that hinders us, overwhelms us. It's into that space that Jesus comes. He comes to rescue, to save, to mend, to transform. He is in the business of helping the blind see, the lame walk, and raising dead things back to life. Jesus loves to come into the chaos to bring peace, to come into the pain to bring healing, and to come into hopelessness and forge unseen possibilities. Jesus is making all things new and establishing the kingdom of God here in our midst. He is setting people free and granting people a new identity. He's taking the lowest in society and raising them up and bringing the powerful down and bringing humility. And this is the work that Nicodemus is being invited to participate in. And this, friends, is the invitation for us today. John says, light has come into the world, but people love the darkness because their deeds are evil. And it's brutal. 
You know, like Jesus is here. He's working, he's moving, he's creating, he's restoring. And yet we'd rather have what we know. The world cannot let go of power, wealth, violence, prestige, and privilege. They're not looking for a savior. And moreover, they may not even know that they're in the dark. The next verse says that people do evil because they do not want their deeds to be exposed. And I find this so incredibly interesting. Self-protection, deceit, image maintenance, and covering up our tracks have become the way of the world. And one of the things I did not expect when I got married was how tempting it is to withhold the truth. You know, I when I say withhold the truth, I don't mean blatant lying, but there definitely was a temptation to not tell Melody things if she didn't ask me. And, you know, like at first it was small, you know, like picking up a McFlurry on the way home from a late night meeting or hoping she didn't ask how many beers I had with a buddy or not handing her a receipt when I bought a couple of new shirts and waiting to see if she would ask. But the small things lead, of uh, the small things of deception lead to bigger things. You know, our cell phone is a good indicator. The anxiety I used to feel if she grabbed my phone to check something quickly. Is there something there she shouldn't see? Would she see that when I said I was working for the last 30 minutes, that part of the time I was actually reading sports news? Did I blast her in that text to a buddy? Did I peek at a website or more than peek that she wouldn't approve of or worse actually would hurt her deeply? And it was in that place that I realized I had a problem. The desire to hide was so incredibly strong. I almost did not have the willpower over it in some cases. And I had this deep desire to live with integrity. I wanted to learn how to let Mel know what I was thinking and feeling both the positive and the incredibly unflattering parts of me. And I have to say, it's not perfect. There's been tears, hard work in therapy, building trust, rebuilding trust. But I feel like I'm in a place where I don't live in fear anymore. I can come home and say, I bought ice cream on the way home and not fear that I'll be condemned. And she's learning how to ask, how is your day? Are you okay? And I know I will experience love. Hiding is no longer my default. And I feel like I'm in a place where I can wholly trust Mel with my phone. I can share it with her with no shame. I feel so thankful that God is slowly bringing me to this beautiful place of freedom. And I've been stepping out of these looming shadows of darkness that have suffocated me almost my whole life. And I'm experiencing a deeper sense of joy, freedom from sin and fullness of life than ever before. Jesus is making me new. And at times I don't even recognize myself. And friends, this is the invitation for us today. Jesus is inviting us to come into the light. You know, Nicodemus comes at night seeking to learn about who Jesus truly is. He struggles, he flounders, and he's confused at the teaching that Jesus gives. His pride, intellect, and social constructs, they get in the way of receiving the good news that Jesus is bringing. Nicodemus stumbles through the conversation, humbled in a way that likely he hasn't been humbled for years. And despite Jesus, uh, Nicodemus's power, position, and knowledge, I imagine there was a deep hunger behind the veneer of having everything together. Perhaps he pondered if he was experiencing the fullness and that God had to offer and desperately wanted more. You know, he was good at doing the right things, you know, publicly seen as holy and righteous, but I wouldn't be surprised if in private he was a mess. Hate, uncertainty, anxiety, lust, they could have privately waged war in his heart, no matter how desperately he tried to follow the law. And Jesus comes and invites him into the light to step out of the darkness, both literally and figuratively, and to believe in him. Jesus invites Nicodemus into life and life to the fullness. And John, interestingly enough, does not tell us in chapter three how Nicodemus responds. This story moves in a new direction and the Pharisee moves deeper into the shadows. 
Now, there is a clue that there is hope for those of us who identify with this character. In John 19, we hear that Nicodemus, along with Joseph of Arimathea, comes and takes the body of Jesus after his death and helps bury him. And this is powerful. The Pharisees help orchestrate the death of Jesus, and yet here is this Pharisee that helps bury Christ. Nicodemus's character is beautifully redeemed at the end of the book. He's willing to publicly care for the body of Jesus in front of all of his peers who had just helped kill him. And it would appear that belief eventually did come to this unlikely character. So as we conclude, remember where our conversation started today. Currently, the world can feel pretty dark. There's a lot to be grieved, a lot to be angry about, and a lot of issues to passionately fight and advocate for. for. But I want to implore you today not to be fooled. The light will dispel the darkness. And it's not as simple as people needing more knowledge, helping people move past their ignorance. It's not just simply that we need more scientific discoveries or better government. You know, these arguments are very compelling in our culture today. But I would argue that darkness is found in every human heart. For light to enter into the world and restore our broken creation, we need to remember the powerful work that Jesus has done on the cross and is doing in all those that have been called upon his name, who have called upon his name. He is the source of goodness, beauty, and hope that our world so desperately needs. And I want to invite you to step into the light today. It could be for the first time accepting God's love. You know, perhaps you've not believed that God loved the world so much that he sent his son to save it. You know, if you feel compelled today to take a step towards God, it can be as simple as thanking him for his gracious love. You know, apologize for the ways that you've wanted to do your life apart from him and invite God's spirit to help you to learn how to follow him. And if you feel like you want to make that first step today, I want to encourage you to tell someone. Secondly, it could be that you feel like you are weighed down by evil. Maybe you know that you're living in secret and and that there is deception and you want to be free. I compel you today to step into the light. Find a trusted friend, mentor, or therapist that you can confide in and begin to peel away the shame, the guilt, and the false self that you are carrying with you. May you experience the freedom that can come through Christ when we no longer have to hide behind the image that we're trying to portray to the world and those that we love. Find your lost self and experience the healing that comes when we can be a whole person, not trying to conceal what is going on in the depths of your heart. What I want you to know today is no matter how dark things may get, or no matter how great the darkness feels within you, Jesus has shown himself to be bigger. And it's my prayer that no matter, you know, how dark the world may feel like it gets in 2022, between COVID, potential wars, natural disasters, sickness, that you would experience the exuding joy, anchoring peace and disarming freedom of knowing that you are loved. Jesus came into the world to seek and to save us exactly as we are, beat up, messed up, damaged, hurting, because he loves us so much. And not only that, he loves us so much that he doesn't leave us the way that he found us. New life takes a little bit of faith. It takes a little bit of risk. And you know what? It takes a whole lot of honesty and a whole lifetime to discover the beauty that is following Jesus. Please don't give up. And may the light abundantly shine into the darkness this next year. And my prayer is that as you let Jesus in and invite more of the power of his Holy Spirit to come into your life, that you would be a beacon 
that truly brings flourishing to the world around you. Not for your own praise or reputation, but for the glory of God. I want to conclude with this little verse from John, John 1, 5. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. May that be your experience again today. I'm just going to pray for you quick. Jesus, I thank you that you are greater than the darkness. I pray that that would be true in our own lives. God, I pray for those today who have become aware that they need a rescuer. Jesus, would we turn to you? And I thank you that you came to seek and to save that which was lost. And a lot of us, when we look at our lives, there's been a lot that has been lost. There is pain, there is brokenness, and there are ways that we know that we have hurt you and that we have hurt others because of our rebelliousness. God, would you reconcile us to you once again? Would we be willing to admit our faults and our need for you? And would you bring us back into relationship with you either for the first time or again anew today? God, we also pray that you would encourage us and help us to step into the light. May we take that brave step and may we be honest about the darkness that is deep within our own hearts and our own soul. And God, I pray that you would give us perseverance to continue to pursue you. And I pray that you would free us from the darkness that is within. May we experience the light that you bring and that end in your gospel. And God, I pray that you, no matter how dark this next year may get, that we would see your light shining and transforming and redeeming people and the world in our midst. And may we not lose sight of your gospel and the promise that you are here, you are working, and you will one day come again to restore this world. May we not give up. We thank you for the power of who you are. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So good to be with you today. I apologize, I'm going a little longer than I expected. Um, I, I hope you were well, and thank you so much for joining me. God bless. Son for redemption, the price for my heart, and I don't have a context for that kind of love. I don't understand, I can't comprehend. All I know is I need you. Run to.
signs long before my first breath running into your arms is running to life from Yeah.